Today, we will continue with the meaning of returning in the fourth generation as it, as it is written in the second book of the History Redemption series. And the meaning of the returning in the fourth generation, we will learn that it comes from the covenant of the torch. This verse, in the fourth generation they shall return, is found in Genesis 15, 16. So as we learned last Wednesday, we know that Genesis 15 reveals the third promise of four that were given in the covenant of the torch by God to Abraham. Now, the phrase, the verse, in the fourth generation, they shall return. We will learn about this tonight. But we reviewed last week what the first, second, and fourth promises were and what the contents were. So now we will learn tonight the third promise. In the fourth generation, they shall return. So we must understand what this means. So let us learn together. So there is a general theological view of what it means by returning in the fourth generation. This is the first thing we will know the theological view of returning in the fourth generation. And this is the view of the majority of theologians and Bible commentators today. And that is that the fourth generation refers to the time of the 400 years of slavery as it refers to in Genesis 15, 13. So theologians believe that this fourth generation refers to the time of the 400 years of slavery. And this 400 years of slavery, of course, was in Egypt when the Israelites were enslaved. And so that means these theologians are looking at this one verse, Genesis 15, 13. And it says, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. So that is why they think returning in the fourth generation refers to these 400 years of slavery. And it says in Genesis 15, 13, again, they will be a slave and oppressed for 400 years. And Genesis 15, 16 says, and then in the fourth generation, they shall return here. So they are equating the theologians are equating fourth generation and 400 years as the same thing. So fourth generation equals 400 years. This is what theologians think. Then that would mean one generation is considered to be 100 years. Why? Because 400 years is one generation. 100 years, 400 years total means one generation. And this is what theologians think. This would mean a generation is seen as a person's entire lifetime, meaning 100 years is seen as a person's lifespan according to the view of general theologians. So please understand that these theologians are equating 400 years with 400 generations and equating one generation or one lifespan as living for 100 years. But there are problems that arise in this theory of one generation being 100 years. So what are the problems 
of the view of these theologians. Number one, it is that the average life expectancy of pre-Abrahamic or pre-Abraham ancestors and subsequent descendants is well over 100 years. The problem is this. The average life of the people who lived before Abraham and the people who lived after Abraham, they lived more than 100 years, many more years than 100 years. For instance, let's look at Abraham's ancestors, the people born before Abraham. And they were people like Noah, who lived 950 years, and Terah. Terah was Abraham's father, and Terah lived 205 years. So we see here that these two ancestors, they lived well over 100 years, and that the average life expectancy, if you calculate it, would be 395 years. So this is well over the 100-year lifespan that general theologians think. And also, how about the descendants that came after Abraham, his own descendants? The Bible tells us that, that Abraham lived to 175 years old. And Moses, who also was a descendant of Abraham, lived to 120 years old. So if you calculate this, the average life expectancy between these generations would be 146 years. So this is also well over 100 years lifespan. So these theologians who believe that one generation is 100 years is wrong. And secondly, what is the problem of their view? It is the range of the 400 years period as slaves and the time frame of the fourth generation are very different when you calculate it. And here is what this means. 400 years these theologians are talking about the time period Abraham's descendants suffered as slaves in Egypt. What about the fourth generation? This is the number of all generations leading up to the fulfillment of the covenant of the torch. So they, the theologians, are considering these as the same thing, 400 years and fourth generation as the same, but they are not. What's a greater number, 400 years or the fourth generation? It's fourth generation because there are many generations that are within the fourth generation. And this is a drawing of the time frame. The so last time we learned that Jacob's 70 family members they entered Egypt. So Jacob and his and his 70 family members they entered Egypt. And they left at the time of the Exodus with Moses as their leader. So the time period in which Jacob's family entered Egypt and the time period in which they made the Exodus is 430 years. So Jacob's family, they lived in Egypt for 430 years. However, Joseph, who was Jacob's son, was the prime minister of Egypt. But after he died and no one remembered him anymore, Jacob's descendants, they were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. They were oppressed for 400 years until the time of the Exodus. And now we see Abraham on the far 
left side, and Canaan on the far right side. So from Abraham until his descendants enter Canaan, the Bible says in the fourth generation of Abraham's descendants, they will enter Canaan. So we know that in the fourth generation is a greater time span than 400 years. So that is why 400 years does not equate to the fourth generation. And that is why these theologians are wrong. And thirdly, what else is a problem with the theologian's view? It is with the word generation in Hebrew. In Hebrew, door means generation. But it does not refer to a word regarding a person's entire lifetime. Dor does not refer to a person's entire lifetime. And Dor is the word used in Hebrew in the Bible, in the original language. So this was also interpreted incorrectly. So this word Dor, which is generation in Hebrew, it also means period, generation, and residence. It's not just one meaning. So door does not refer to a person's lifespan. So according to the Bible, the period of time between the birth of a person and the birth of the next generation, their child, is about 30 years. So we're just talking about the time between the birth of one person to another person. It's about 30 years. So they're born, they grow up, they get married, and then they have a child. That takes about 30 years. So that's a period. That's the next generation. So it takes about 30 years for the next generation to reproduce. So it is estimated that the average years in one generation is 30 years based on the Bible. And what is the biblical basis for this? This is found in the Bible itself, specifically in the Genesis 11 genealogies. So the age in which one generation begot another generation is 30 years. How do we know? We use the examples. For example, Adam's 12th generation, Arpekshad, to his 18th generation, Nahor. They all had children about 30 years of age. We find this in Genesis 11, 12. It says, Arpekshad lived 35 years and became the father of Shelah. So this is saying that it took 35 years for the next generation to be born. And in Genesis eleven fourteen, 14, Shelah, he lived 30 years, and then he had Eber. So it took 30 years for the next generation to be born here. And Genesis eleven sixteen, 16, Eber, how old was he when he had Peleg, his son? He was 34 years old. So when Eber was 34 years old, he had the next generation, Peleg. And now Peleg, he had Ru, his son, when he was 30 years old. So it's always around 30 years of age that the next generation is born. And we continue with Genesis 11:20. Ru, who was the son of Peleg, he had Sarug at 32 years old. And Genesis 11.22 tells us that Sarug had Nahor at 30 years old. And lastly, Genesis 11.24, Nahor had Terah, who is Abraham's father, at 29 years old. So, 
So it shows in the Bible clearly that the next generation was born approximately 30 years after the former generation was born. And not only this, but let's look at Job. We all know Job in the Bible. So Job, he comes after Abraham and after the Exodus and after the conquest of of Canaan. So we can actually be confused as to what time frame Job lived. But we must know that he came from the same patriarchal time frame along with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he lived in the same time frame as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, almost the same time frame. And we find this in Genesis, in, in Job 42, 16. And we see how many descendants Job had. And it says, and after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his grandsons four generations. So if we calculate 140 years divided by four generations, we see that each generation had their next generation at about 35 years old. So it's just like the genealogies in Genesis 11. Almost after 30 to 35 years, the next generation begot or bore the next generation. So one generation is about 35 years or 30 years. So we now have reason to dispute the theologian's view that 400 years is the same as fourth generation. So then what is the correct interpretation? It is the biblical interpretation of returning in the fourth generation. We must know what God meant when he said return in the fourth generation. So we can only find the answer through the Bible. It must be interpreted through the Bible. So looking at the actual genealogies in the Bible and the generations, which is door in Hebrew, we must know the years it took for the next generation to be born. And we must know how many generations from Abraham did his descendants return to the land of Canaan after their enslavement in Egypt. So we must understand how many generations there were from Abraham after their enslavement in Egypt and their conquest of the land of Canaan when they entered Canaan. So in order to find out what God meant when he said return in the fourth generation, we must start from Abraham's descendants, of course. And if we look at Exodus 6, 16 to 20, we look at the genealogy of Moses. Some people think that Moses' line begins the calculations of the fourth generation. But this is not true. And this is why. In Exodus 6.16, it says, And these are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations, Gershon and Koath and Merari. So we are examining Moses' line. So we're looking at Levi who had Koath. And if we look at Exodus 6.18, it talks about the sons of Koath. So Amram is considered a son of Koath. And then in Exodus 6.20, it says Amram bore or had Aaron and Moses. So Amram is the father of Aaron and Moses. So if we look at Moses' line, 
How many generations is it from Abraham to Moses? So Abraham is generation number one because he received the covenant of the torch. And then the second generation is Isaac and then his son Jacob and then Levi. He's one of the 12 sons of Jacob and Levi had Koath. And then the Bible says that he had Amram and then Amram was the father of Moses and Aaron. So Moses could not enter Canaan, correct? He was of the first generation. So we know that clearly. But Gershom was of the second generation, and he was able to enter Canaan. So this is, if we count it, eight generations. That is why Moses' line is not the fourth generation that returned to Canaan. So we are speaking about Moses' line because there are some theologians that think that Moses' line is the line of the fourth generation that returned into Canaan. But in the genealogies, we have to know there's an omission. There are omitted generations, even in this line of Moses. So we know Jacob had Levi. And Jacob, with the 70 family members, entered Egypt. And Levi was one of these 70 family members. So Levi went into Egypt. But at the time of Moses, we know they made the great exodus. And we know that Levi had Koah. But then we see that there is a discrepancy because Levi entered Egypt at the time when there was no slavery. But Moses made the exodus at the end of slavery, 400 years later. So look at the genealogies here. There's missing Generations, if we look from Levi, Koath, Amram, and Moses, that is why the question mark is there. How many generations were omitted? There were many because 400 years passed after the enslavement until the Exodus. And we know clearly that Amram was the father of Moses. And Levi was definitely the father of Koath. So do you see where the omission is? The omission is from the, from generation five to generation six. There are generations omitted. So then why then does the Bible say Koath begot Amram? It is because of the translation. Here, the word son in Hebrew is ben. Ben can mean sons, but it also means grandsons and descendants. So the Bible says the sons of Koas, and it says Amram is our Hebron and Uziel. And that was in Exodus 6, 18. But Sons, here in verse 18, is Ben, which is descendants. So if you look at Exodus 6.16, 6, it says the son of Levi, Koath, which in Hebrew is Ben, which is the word son. But as said in Exodus 6.18, here the word son in Ben translates to descendants. So Amram is not the actual son of Koath, but a descendant of Koath. And that is why there are omissions in Moses' genealogy from Koath to Amram. So it's not that the Bible is incorrect. The Bible is correct. It's just the translation is not.
And so we see that eight generations are also recorded here regarding Moses' line. And we know this is not the fourth generation because the Bible here records eight generations. So based on the genealogy of Joshua, this is the second leader of the wilderness journey. Now Joshua entered Canaan, but Joshua's line is not the line that returned in the fourth generation. Why? Because in Joshua's line, there are 14 generations recorded in 1 Chronicles 7, verses 20 through 27. So Moses' line had eight generations until they entered Canaan. And the second leader, Joshua, he had 14 generations till the time they entered Canaan. So neither Moses or Joshua's line is the fourth generation referred to in the covenant, the torch. So if you look at Joshua's line here, it begins with Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob, the third generation. And then Joseph. Why? Because Joshua came from the line of Joseph. Joseph's son was Ephraim. So Joseph's son was Ephraim, and Ephraim's descendant was Joshua. So if we calculate all this from First Chronicles, there is 14 generations. And in this recording of the generations, there is no omission, but it's still 14 generations and not in the fourth generation. So the thing that we must understand at this point is that the Bible is always correct. It is inerrant. The Bible is not wrong. So the Bible is inerrant, but it can be seen that the four generations that God talks about, how they are to return in the fourth generation, God is not talking about direct lineal generations, but spiritual generations, generations that had faith. So this is the perspective that we must have when we interpret these mysteries in the Bible. And we must interpret it. Why? Because if we don't, people will discredit the Bible. But when we study and understand, we can explain. We must know so that people will not say that the Bible is wrong. So the next time we will understand who the fourth generation really is. So the conclusion of today's lesson is this, is that God considers the spiritual generations, those who had faith, and he calls them his children. Abraham, even though he was the father of faith, he was not the only one who received the promise and was to fulfill it. But through Abraham's descendants, through the line of faith, they were able to receive the covenant as well and fulfill it. So we must be the generation of believers, the generation of faith who carries on this covenant of the torch and fulfill it so we can enter Canaan. And remember, October 27th and 28th, this is our last Bible conference of our church this year. So as those of the fourth generation of faith, May we use that special time to evangelize the lost souls. And may we all become the fulfillers of the covenant of the torch. I bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear loving Father God, today, with your word, we have learned about 
the promise, the third promise of returning in the fourth generation. And as we continue to learn, may we be able to understand what your words mean in the Bible. Let us not just gloss over the Bible and not understand the mysteries within it, but may we deeply understand your word. And when we do, may we understand that you want us to be the faithful, the line that returns in the fourth generation, the ones that enter the land of Canaan. And we pray that you allow us to be the firstborns, the ones who hold on to the covenant, and not only us, but our families, the people around us, May we be that fourth generation that fulfills your covenant of the torch and have victory in this land and enter Canaan. And as you look upon us and our families and our children of faith, may we all have the psalm strength faith. May we continue this faith to our family members. And may our children of faith, may they long for the word, study the word. May you allow this desire to grow in their hearts. We pray you will, and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give glory to God.